'Twas the night before Christmas, and taken out of his house, a boy of just four was quiet as a mouse. Not a word passed his lips as he went into care. He was going away, and he didn't know where. No curling up warm and snug in his bed, no dreams of Santa's sleigh in his little head. Nowhere to go, no filled stockings to leave, shivering in a squad car on Christmas Eve. The social worker tried her best on the phone to find him a place that he could call home. But families were busy and with no next of kin. For this Christmas child, there was no room at the inn. With nobody willing to take him, they found him instead, a hospital ward with one empty bed. But is this where we leave him for his Christmas day? Or could we together find a different way? What if the social worker, still on the phone, found him somewhere that he could call home? A family who knew the meaning of the Christmas manger, the place where young Jesus sheltered from danger. A bed is inflated, mum and dad can sleep by the fire, an extra stocking is crudely hung up with wire. One extra place is laid at the table, one extra cracker, napkin with label. The loft is raided, small trousers are pressed, and a shirt is found to fit the young guest. And a small pile of gifts grow under the tree, with his name on tags like it was just meant to be. If you got the phone call, I wonder if you would, offer the little boy a home for good, and make him feel loved and protected from danger. Let's celebrate Christmas and welcome the stranger. hard-hitting video isn't it it's uh it's it's one that, that always gets me and i can see a few tears around the room actually um and i have to be honest i'm i'm not aware of a child going into a hospital ward like that um i'm not i'm not sure if that happens maybe it does um but i am aware of um of one boy that that came to us and uh he he was searching for his or oh, the social worker was searching for his forever home. He, he wanted a, a mummy and a daddy. Um, and I can remember, and apologies if I shared this before, but I can remember him sitting on my lap and um, we we're playing on the Wii and he, um, we we're playing Mario Kart and he asked to be um, baby Mario. And he said, you can, be, you can be Mario and I can be baby Mario and then you can be my dad and I can be your son. And I always, wish that I could share that there was a, a nice happy ending to that story. Um, but for him, he was one of the children that was considered unadoptable. Um, and unadoptable is such a, a grim word. Um, when a child, because perhaps they've got a disability, or perhaps they're, they're too old, kind of five or upwards, um, or perhaps they're part of a, a sibling group or a um, uh, or something like that, just means that, that actually there aren't the people out there to, to adopt them. And we, we're in a funny place uh, in the UK at the moment where we've actually got more people wanting to adopt and approved to adopt than we have children um, waiting to be adopted, which sounds fantastic, but actually the problem comes down to, to the matching. So we've got um, perhaps three or 4,000 people waiting to adopt. But for lots of them, and totally understandably, the children they're waiting to adopt are, are newborn babies um, with, with kind of as few issues as, as possible. And as, as Home for Good, we're starting to put a different message across and say, well, hang on, what, what about if we stopped searching for the right child for our family and started working out if we could be the right family for this child? What about if we said that actually we could care for this child with a disability? What about if we were willing to turn our life totally upside down and take on a sibling group of four children? Um, I'm not quite sure who's brave enough to do that, to be honest. Um, but it's, it's a massive, massive challenge. And you, you, you see the reality, or I see the reality of this doing the job. They have, um, they, they have magazines, which I always look at, think look a bit like the, uh, the magazines from Cats and Dogs Homes, where they have pictures 
and a little description of the children waiting to be adopted. And, um, and they, they give a little bit of information. I can remember seeing one of them, and it had a picture with four children on it. Um, and that's hard to place. And two of those children were, were over five, and that's hard to place. And then I remember seeing the next month, um, I, I saw those children again, except there were only two of those children because two of the children, the younger two, had already been adopted, and the older two were still living in that foster home, waiting to be adopted, probably never going to be adopted because of their age. Um, so as Home for Good, we're, we're just trying to challenge the church to think differently, to say that actually, you know, we've got a biblical mandate of caring for the orphan, of caring for the, the vulnerable. Um, and the challenge is, is there to consider doing that. But also, as Home for Good, we look at the support side as well. And I'm well aware that within this church, we've got, um, we've got foster carers, um, but we've also got um, kinship carers. We've got, we've got grandparents and aunties that, that look after their children. Um, and we've got children that are, are looked after by family members. And Home for Good wants to challenge us to say, how can we support those people? How can we wrap round to give them support and guidance? Because that's a really hard thing to do. It's hard to take in um, a child, perhaps a family member, and to care for them and to love them. Um, and how can we do that support? And we, we talk about practical support. So we, we talk about things like cooking meals and those kind of things when things are hard. We talk about... Um, all sorts of things. We've got kind of cafes running across the country where, um, where, where people come and they sit in the cafe and someone else does their ironing for them. Um, whenever I mention that, it's always the social workers that get most excited at that thought. Um, but, but things like that. And, and we're not saying necessarily do them within the church. In Bath, we're lucky we've got a local movement. So if you wanted to get involved, you could get involved with, with the local movement in Bath and come and speak to me to find out about that. Um, and then just also dispelling myths. I'm aware that with, with Katrin sat at the back there, social workers have an incredibly hard job. Um, they get into the media when they take children away too early, and they get into the media when they remove children too late. Um, it's a bit of a thankless task, and that's an understatement. Um, a lot of social workers are physically and verbally abused um, each year, perhaps each week, um, and it's, it's a really tough job. So as part of Home for Good, we try to dispel the myths around social workers um, and those kind of things as well. So um, I think that's probably all I want to say, but do come and ask if you've got any questions. I mean, let's give Luca a round of applause as well. That's, that's the... Okay, would you turn in your Bibles, if you've got one in front of you, to uh, Exodus, beginning of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 25, but we're actually going to start, one. you've put it down for me, yeah, you put it open on my, Ziggy put the Bible prepared for me on the, on the top here already but we're going to we're going to finish at 25 we're going to start at 19 um, and you're going to read more scripture this morning than you have done for a long time Are you excited about that and don't all say yes at once you know that's great yeah okay um, today's talk beautiful home um, we have started at the beginning God creates us with a beautiful image he puts us in his temple. He puts us in the earth, which is his temple, and he wants to reside in his temple. He puts us, the focus of his creation, right in the center of the temple. We go astray, but God makes a promise to us, beautiful promises from Noah, the colorful rainbow promise of God, and then with Abraham, he promises to, to call out a new people for his name. The people get enslaved uh, in Egypt, and then he does this amazing rescue story, amazing kind of way of getting them out of the grip of the demonic powers uh, of Egypt. And they're brought into a place of beautiful freedom. And we remember the message that Kate gave us the other week, just before she left, uh, inviting us to step into the freedom that God has given us. Do you remember her words? Do you remember her words? Her words were to us, that we have been given this freedom, but there is something holding us back and we need to walk into it. 
We need to walk further into the freedom that we've been given. Just remind us of that word. Then we followed on the story and how they came out through the Red Sea and then they got stuck uh, because they ran out of water. And then we, we looked at the story of water and God's provision. A beautiful way that God helps us even when we get to a place of bitterness, he then refreshes us. Do you remember that? And if anyone here is today um, is still in a place of bitterness, uh, you know, where the water feels bitter, then look around, pray, lift your head up, call out to God like Moses did. Look around for the, for the strange sign, the, the stick on the floor, the, the piece of wood on the floor, and be ready to respond to what God is showing you because he wants to bring you life and life in all its fullness. And then last week, Claire... Uh, We touched, uh, Claire led us uh, talking about the beautiful way or uh, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. And we looked at just one of those and we looked at rest. And I wonder whether we are people of rest. And there was a challenge last week for us to becoming more restful people. Uh, This is just one of the Ten Commandments, the fourth one, uh, the Sabbath day. It's hard to rest, isn't it? It's an engine pushing us forward, isn't it? And it's not God's. It's not God's desire for us. You know, the engine of creation finished and then he rested. And the first day we got given, we were, we were made on the sixth day. What was our first day? It was the seventh day, wasn't it? What was the seventh day? The day of rest. The first experience that we had was holiday. That's good, isn't it? It's the other way around in our lives, isn't it? God invites us to a day of rest. Okay, we're at Exodus 19. On page 76. You with me? On the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai, After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Okay, so we're in front of a mountain now. Now you need to help the pictures. Hopefully the screens will help us. And there's an awful lot of moving up and down this mountain and the the front of the mountain. Okay, The, the location of this thing helps us with the story. And that's why it's mentioned in scripture. It's not just incidental. It's part of what we're learning today. So we're out of Egypt, we're through the desert, we've been provided for, and we're now camped at the bottom of a mountain. Then, verse 3, then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him, Yahweh called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Lovely. Isn't that beautiful? What a beautiful image. I carried you on eagles' wings. I love that. Beautiful image. Carried you on eagles' wings and brought you where? Where did God bring us? You're going a bit quiet. To himself. Brought you to myself. It's really important that we we hear this message that we're we're rescued not into a distant land. We're rescued to home. I brought you home. I brought you to myself. Yeah? Okay. Beautiful. Then Moses went up to God. Did you see that? Did you notice that the ball at the bottom or the little thing went up on the screen? Do you like that? Then Moses went up to God. There's a lot of going up and down the mountain now. So uh, just keep an eye on what, what's happening in the story. Um, Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt. Now if you obey me and fully keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Keep my covenant. Keep my promises. You'll be my treasured possession. I'll hold you in my hand. Although the whole earth is mine, you will forever be a kingdom of priests. Um, There is something that went wrong somewhere in the church's life where there was a distinction made between priests 
and non-priests, between priests and lay people. You heard the phrase lay people? It means laos, people of God. Uh, and there's priests, presbyters. And there's a dysfunction that's gone on in the church and, and we've picked it up and ran with it and it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, It's wrong. All of us have been called to be priests. God always wanted the whole nation to be priests. Not a special group of priests, but all of us to be priests. So put your dog collar on tomorrow morning and walk around with pride because you are a priest. You are a priest. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back down, there the ball goes, and summoned the elders of, and the people and set before them the word of the Lord that he commanded them to speak. The people and all, all the people responded together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back up to the Lord. Now, if you're Moses, you're thinking, flipping it, this is hard work, isn't it? But anyway, he offered troops up the mountain again, takes his, takes his message, he goes up and down, Connecting to God, up and down. God's at the top, Moses is at the bottom, people are at the foot of the mountain. So Moses went back down, and then he goes back up. The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come down to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you, and they will always put their trust in you. And then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. So here's uh, an, another way of looking at that saying, here's the mountain. And Moses goes up to the mountain and God is coming down on top of the mountain. The Lord said to Moses, go back down. And Moses thought, what, again? Go back down to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Make them wash their clothes and be ready for the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And then he says an interesting thing. He says, put, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them to be careful. Be careful and do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain will be put to death. Why, why is God doing this? Why is God putting this kind of uh, yellow and black tape around the bottom of the mountain? Why is he saying you mustn't go up the mountain, only Moses can come up the mountain? Why is he stopping people from getting close to him? Moses goes back down. Moses, after Moses come down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and washed their clothes. And then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day. Now notice the third day. We know that has an echo of another third day a little bit later on in scripture. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood did they go up the mountain no they didn't they didn't go up the mountain because there was yellow tape around the bottom of the mountain they stood at the foot of the mountain as close as they could get to the presence of God Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it with fire the smoke billowed up like smoke from a furnace can you picture it and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder and louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God, Yahweh, the creator of the universe, who spoke the heavens into being, spoke out. Amazing. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses up to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up. And the Lord said to him, go down. Do you, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> have you ever noticed this before? And it's funny, isn't it? It makes me laugh every time. I, when I got this and I suddenly started looking at it, I was thinking, poor old Moses, he's been up and down this like a flipping yo-yo. He's just gone up and down. Imagine you're, you're Moses. You're called, Moses, I want you to come to the top of the mountain. <laughs> go down. I've just got here. Go down and warn the people. Do not force their way through to see the Lord, and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. I am a consuming fire. You can't get close to me. You will burn up if you come close to me. If you come close to the sun, you'll burn up. If we are any closer to the sun, the earth wouldn't survive. 
The creator of the sun is descending to the top of the mountain and he's saying, you can't come close to me. My, because of who I am, because I'm the creator of the universe, you can't come close to me. Yeah? For your own sake, don't come close. So Moses said to the Lord, the people can't come up Mount Sinai because you yourself have warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. So the Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. So Moses went down to the people again and he told them. And with these words, he said, and he spoke the words of God, I am the Lord your God. Now that's the bit from Exodus uh, tw chapter 20. I am the Lord, if you turn the page, uh, or if it's not quite, and, the God, and God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. The whole of Exodus 20, 21, 22, 23 is God speaking. So here's, here we've got another image. Moses at the bottom of the mountain, God is descending to the top of the mountain. And there is a cloud a furnace, a consuming fire at the top of the mountain. It's scary and worrying and, and everyone trembles. And God speaks out of the fire, out of the cloud, out of the heaviness. Uh, glory, another word for glory in, in, in scripture would be heaviness. The heaviness of God descends upon the top of the mountain. It's a terrifying thing to be in the presence of almighty God. And God speaks. And when God speaks to his people, he gives us a whole load of uh, ways of living. And because the people have already been, say, uh, been sold uh, to live according to the covenant, to the promise. So God gives them the promise and the way of living. He said, this is how you should live. Have no other gods before me. Rest on the Sabbath. Don't kill, don't lie. Speak the truth. Don't commit adultery. He gives us all sorts of rules, but he also gives us ideas about how to treat the stranger in a foreign land, how to treat those who've been killed or maimed. And so if you could read on from Exodus 20, I won't read it now, but if you read on from Exodus 20 to 21 to 22 and 23, a whole load of other laws. Look, just, just turn the page in your Bibles. If you've got them, you can see them at the headings. So 20, 21, Hebrew servants, personal injuries in 21. 22, protection of property. Social responsibility, laws of justice and mercy, Sabbath laws, three annual festivals, God, God's angels to prepare the way. Exodus chapters 20 to 23 is God speaking, giving them a beautiful way of living. People of God, are you listening to me this morning? We need to pay attention when God speaks. When God speaks and gives us a way to walk in, it is best to walk in that way. If there is any of us that are walking off the way, time to get back on the way. <laughs> you with me? Let's all walk together on this way, or else we'll be people not of the covenant, we'll be choosing to break the covenant, won't we? Yeah? The cloud has spoken. The fire is breathing his fire, and he's saying, come on the way with me. This is the way to go. Live this beautiful life. Don't live a distorted way of living. Live my beautiful life with me. I know, I know that um, you're hearing the challenge this morning. And it's a whisper of the Spirit. Just come back to me, come back to me, come back to me. Walk in my ways and your way will prosper. Commit your way to the Lord and the Lord will bless you. Isn't that right? Now for some of us, we travel all sorts of other ways. And I'm just, um, there's a pleading in me this morning about, from God, I would say. God wants to say to us this morning, bring your family with you into the way of the Lord. Bring your life with you into the way of the Lord. Bring your money with you into the way of the Lord. Bring your life with you into the way of the Lord. Bring everything that you have with you and follow my way. Simple message. You with me? Yeah? Okay. So this is all happening at the bottom of the mountain. People are listening. God speaks powerfully. And then Exodus 24 Moses enacts the covenant again. He reenacts the covenant. So let's just look at Exodus 24. If you want to read it on the screen, you can do. If you want to read it in your Bibles, you can do. Verse 1 of Exodus 24. You with me? Yeah. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron. <laughs> Nadab. Now there's a, a, an un, 
used very biblical name. If you want, if you've got a child and you want to have a, a biblical name, Nadab. How about that as a name? Or Abihu. Anyone want to choose that instead of um, one of the popular ones? And seventy of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at the distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord, and the others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. So he. Uh, Slightly different in uh, two versions. He got up early the next morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. Where where have I got that from? Oh, that's uh, halfway through verse 4, actually, isn't it? He got up early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls. The other half he splashed against the altar and he took the book of the covenant, the book of the promise, and he read it to the people and they responded. And they responded. Okay, I'm going to do that again. He took the book of the covenant and he read it to the people and they responded. See, Moses was kind of like doing the deal, wasn't he? God has spoken. God has spoken out of the clouds. And he wants to know whether everyone's hooked in or not. He gets the book of the covenant. He gets a blue piece of paper called covenant on it. Do you remember that? He gives it out to the people. He says, will you do this? Will you walk in the way of the Lord? And the people respond with one voice. We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. We will obey. There's still an opportunity for those who want to sign a covenant and make a commitment to do that. Moses then took the blood. Do you remember with covenants, with Abraham's covenant? It was all symbolized with, this, with the uh, flowing of blood. That's how covenants are made, sealed with blood. So Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people. You're, you're marked with the blood. This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Remind you of anyone else? Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel under his feet because they're looking up, they're not going the whole way up. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli. I don't know what that is. Anyone, anyone got any ideas? Lapis lazuli? Blue stone. Well done, Hannah. Well done. As bright blue as the sky. So they kind of go halfway up and they see God, the underside of God, and it's bright blue. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. And they saw God and they ate and drank. Verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, come up to me, up onto the mountain and stay here. And I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments that I've written for their instruction. So then Moses set out with Joshua, his assistant, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and everyone involved in the dispute can go with them. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. On the seventh day, the Lord called from the mountain. And he called to Moses from within the cloud, to the Israelites from below. The glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. And then Moses entered the cloud. And as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God. Remind you of anyone? Yeah? So here is Moses going halfway up, seeing the feet of God, or underneath of God, as it were. And then he goes all the way to the top. He goes right into the cloud, into the presence, into the thickness, into the heaviness of God. Can you imagine how that would be? And he meets with God for 40 days and 40 nights. What a privilege that would have been. What a privilege to be in the presence of Almighty God who made heavens and earth. Exodus 25. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. So he goes into the cloud for 40 days and 40 nights and and God speaks to Moses and he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and get them to give some stuff to me. Hmm, What's this about? You are to receive the offering from me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. 
Do you like that? Kind of cheerful givers. The open-handed ones. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, bronze, purple, blue and purple and scarlet yarn, fine linen, goat hair, ram skins, dyed red and other types of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense and onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and the breastplate. And then let them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. The list that I've just read out rather fast is the best of the best of the best of the best. This is not your Primark stuff. This is not your little stuff. This is the best of the best. And do you know where it came from? It came from Egypt. The Egyptians gave it to them on their way out. Do you remember that story? They had received it freely and freely they were to give. And what were they going to do with all this beautiful stuff? They were going to make a sanctuary. They were going to make a home. They were going to make a dwelling place, a tabernacle for God. So here's the picture. Top of the mountain, Moses is speaking and meeting with God. And God says, I want to come down. I want you to make a tabernacle. I want you to make a home for me so I can be close to you all the time. I want to come down and live with you. I want the fire to come and live with you. I want the cloud to come and live with you. I want my presence to come and live with you. I want to dwell with you. I want to make my home with you. You might, uh, when you look at the dimensions of the of the tabernacle it's kind of this kind of shape and there's an inner bit and there's an outer bit and it looks like this someone has made a, a life scale model of the of it uh, in israel a brilliant little picture of it and you can see it's not much bigger than this church in fact it probably isn't bigger than it it's probably twice the size in length as this church but the same kind of width it's not huge it's not a cathedral and there's a tent at the front end and that's the holy place. So it's not like a cathedral which blows your mind and you go, wow, isn't that amazing? God's here. Look, look at the stones. Look how beautiful this is. This is not a temple from, the, from Herod's temple, the massive temple that Jesus walked into and knew. No, this is a, a very intimate, small space with just a bit of a material flapping around the edge, marking the edge, and then in the center there's a, there's a small holy place. This is the thing that God wants the Israelites to make. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Made his... That's right made his dwelling among us. Jesus said, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. He's talking about himself. And, the, and Paul says a bit later on, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives among you? And Jesus said, remain in me, as I also remain in you. The message of today is that God wants to come close to us. He really wants to come close to us and make his home in our homes. He wants to come and dwell among us. The cloud wants to come and fill our homes. Do you remember in the story um, they had to clean themselves ready for the cloud to come? Do you remember in the story of making of the, of the sanctuary they had to choose the best of the best of the best? 
in order to make the kind of the presence of God able to dwell in this place. We are God's temple. He wants to dwell in us. He wants to dwell in us. How do we access this dwelling presence of God? How do we access this? You see, it's interesting, isn't it? There are there are a lot of there's a lot of this story, and I've gone through it really fast. And for some of you, it's just gone straight over the top of your head. It's felt a bit technical, a bit odd. Why is there so much stuff about God's presence in this bit of the Bible? It's because the presence is the most important thing. He wants to press his presence into us, into his people. In a moment, Moses is going to be moved on. And God says to Moses, I'm going to move you on now. It's time to move. And Moses says one thing. He says, well, you better come with me. Because if without your presence, we are nothing. We're no different from any other people. And that's exactly the truth. Without God's presence in our lives, we are just like everybody else. Aren't we? Aren't we? Now, I'm facing challenges right now. And you're facing challenges right now. We need God's presence in our lives for these challenges, don't we? 